Major funding for Witness Voices from the Holocaust was provided by the Charles H. Revson Foundation, the DeRote Foundation, and the Fortunoff Foundation. Times became hard because um, Hitler became more powerful and it disturbed our beautiful life. We didn't know from one day to the other what's going to happen. The family was very strong and uh, it was just unthinkable absolutely unthinkable that somebody or some power would be able to unroot us. First of all, we felt that if there's going to be a war, it's going to be like a blitzkrieg. It's going to last maybe a month or so and then it's going to be over. So we felt, well, if it's only going to last for a little while, the Jews will survive. They always somehow do. We didn't think it's going to last long, first of all. Number two, we didn't believe what he, what he said or what, what he's going to do, that it's going to really happen. One of the members of the family was a um, brancher, an SR man. And one night, they marched by our window with torches and singing as our songs and stopping at the house of this relative of mine and uh, bringing him some sort of a salute. And I also remember how impressed I was that somebody would get a whole torchlight parade. This is me as a 10-year-old, very proud, as a matter of fact, uh, to have this uniform. I believe at that time, everybody reaching a certain age had to join the Hitler Youth. The greetings were changed from uh, Salve de Discipli and Salve Magister. It was changed to um, Heil Hitler. We had to, uh, he came in and he said, Heil Hitler uh, students, and we had to stand up and say, Heil Hitler teacher. And then we had a different curriculum because we had this uh, Rassenkunde which is uh, raciology. That was a regular subject that we had, and we were supposed to learn what an Aryan is, the Aryan race. And uh, opposed to the Aryan race, we were the Jews. Uh, and the children were to, the, the students were to learn what uh, makes the difference between a blonde, blue-eyed, pure Aryan to a Jew. And I hated this biology teacher with a, uh, with a passion, he, he always pulled me up on my sideburns. And he put me in front of the class, and I see, now here's a Jew. And uh, he started to describe my nose and my cheekbones and my hair and my features and uh, how to recognize a Jew. And I was very humiliated, and I, I, I hated it, and I, was, uh, uh, I felt terrible about the whole thing. All my friends, that I was good friends, that I would never think that they would do it. They were singing anti-Semitic songs, and they make up, they made up songs. And uh, I recall one one song. Uh, uh, they were singing it. It says, "Remember, Jew, you are on Polish soil. Your bones we will pile on a heap. Hitler's calamity you will not avoid, and we will beat your crippled destiny with a whip." 
when we lived amongst these people before 1939, we knew that they hated us. Because in Poland, there was nothing hidden. Ever since I could remember as a child, going to school, I would see on the street, be it on a fence or on a building of a Jewish home, or front of a Jewish store, or on the sidewalk. There were signs, you call it graffiti here today, signs all over the place, Jew, go to Palestine. You filthy Jew, we don't want you in Poland. And of course, the anti-Semitism in Poland was becoming more open because Hitler was in Germany, so the Nazi party had a great influence on the Polish nationalist party. They had a priest. He published a newspaper. His name was Ksiądz Czechak, Father Czechak. He published the most anti-Semitic newspaper, if you want to be. And as a joke, is it okay if I tell a joke? There's a Jewish sure. man sitting in Warsaw on a bench, and he has this anti-Semitic paper. And he's reading it. So another friend, the Jew, passes by and he says, Rab Chaim, was lent there the site of the What are you reading this paper? He says, Rab Shloyman, if I read, read the Jewish papers, all I read is about Soros. The Jews are pogromed here, they're this, they're that. Look what they're doing in Germany. I'm depressed. So if I want to feel good, I take the anti-Semitic paper. And it says, the Jews own all the apartment houses in Poland. <laughs> the Jews own all the factories. The Jews are the richest. They control the world. They control America. And, the, and Roosevelt is a Jew. Makes me feel good. That's right. <laughs> That's the kind of a life that was going on. And uh, this was the 30s. It was getting the clouds were getting dark. When es dem international Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. I remember the beginning of the war. I remember the speech of Hitler. Uh, I remember the whole frenzy that all of a sudden rose up and where I was, in the environment that I was, the people I knew, including my teachers, was all for the war. And I think in conjunction with that, for whatever stood in its way to be destroyed, I wasn't even unhappy about that. I thought of war, I'm gonna be a hero. And tanks were rolling by day and night. We were sitting in the windows. We were so caught up by this display of might that uh, I thought, my God, I, I'm so glad I'm here. I remember the war coming to our town with a very severe air raid. I remember the whole city was a, just a, an inferno, and we all ran for our lives. We crossed a river called the Vistla, and certain things you, you can remember. And one of the things I remember is we were crossing on a little boat. We just looked at a wall of fire in, in the back of us. And it was bombing, constant bombing. And everyone was going towards east. The roads were littered with trucks and bodies bodies and bodies everywhere, and I was swept with this tide of people going east. I had no idea how to get home. I had no idea how my family feared. And everyone was trying to evacuate, but there was no way, no way. There was a Polish girl in my dormitory who was very good to me, who helped me out a lot, and I figured out, gee, she's only a couple of miles away from here. I'll stop there and I'll get something to wear to cover myself. I had a flimsy nightgown now. As soon as I came down to her gate, she said, get away from here, you dirty Jew. And this is the first time that it hit me, that I really understood what it's all about. We had refugees from Poland, Polish Jews, who told us, do something, go, go to, the, um, go to America, go to Israel, go to Palestine, do something, escape, because that's what's going to happen to you. And we thought, that's impossible. 
I mean, my father was born here, his father was born here, and I, my great-grandfather uh, 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 was born here. It's impossible, but we didn't know enough. Had we known enough, I think we would have done more. My mother decided that uh, she's going to go over to a friend of hers, who turns out to be a German. She went to her friend and said, well, look here, I don't know what's going to happen to us. I've got here some money. Keep it for me. Keep it. I don't know whether I'm going to come back, but if the kids are going to come home, give it to them. Give it to them. If not, keep it. This very friend of hers went to the authorities, and she turned in my mother. The real fear was from denunciation. Uh, suppose you would try to hide a Jewish person. In our city, it was not safe. Somebody would denounce you. So this I hold up as a crime, as a collective crime. Our people were still too anti-Semitic. And the nice, the good people on whom the Jewish friends could have counted were the most scared, the, the most weak, the, the least uh, prepared to take on this huge, brutal machinery which exploded all around them. We still couldn't believe what the Germans had in mind, total annihilation of our people. It was still beyond comprehension. As a matter of fact, for the bulk of the 68 months under the German occupation, at no time did I realize or believe that the, this was a total annihilation process going on. In the beginning, they organized the ghetto, and they pushed all the people from the small little towns. They pushed us in and about, I don't know how many square blocks, and they built uh, walls around the boys' or ghetto. Uh, it, 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 you were trapped. I don't know if you, anybody can feel this feeling, you know, with, with all the freedom we have today. Uh, nobody can feel this feeling of being trapped. Every day there were different decrees. Jews uh, turn in your bicycles, Jews turn in your valuables, Jews turn in your winter coats, uh, children are not allowed to go to school, Jews don't walk on sidewalks. One day they said they want 25 bookkeepers. So of course people who were bookkeepers volunteered. They were all shot on the spot. Then came about the edict of hostages. Ten Jewish men were named as hostages, and their names were posted on placards all over town. Should anything happen to a German, those 10 men would be executed. They knew, because of the hostage system, nothing would happen to them. This, perhaps, is also one of the reasons why the majority of the people in the free world cannot comprehend Why six million people could allow themselves to be led to the slaughter? Like sheep, without lifting a finger in their defense. It is very difficult to raise a finger against a machine gun. It is also very difficult to live knowing that because of my foolish act, 10 men have been executed, and they are widows and orphans.
we would hear certain sounds of boots on the street. And usually whenever there was a transport, it was accompanied by 10 to 12 soldiers coming, marching together from house to house and gathering all the people, knocking on the doors and saying, you, you have an hour. And we used to live in terror of these boots. And my parents were both deaf and I had a deaf sister. So I became the ears. I would have to warn them that the transport was coming. We heard the stool, we heard noise outside the house. They were yelling to Germans. And they, uh, and they came to the door and they burst into the room. They kicked the door open with bayonet, fixed bayonet, steel helmet strapped around the face. All, all paraphernalia wall, full of them. And they started to yell. We should undress. So we all undressed, mother and women and men. And then one of them said that uh, my father didn't undress quick enough. And he started to beat him on the face with a bayonet, you know, poking, like this. And they started to took out the matches. And I thought that they're going to strike the matches. No, they took out and they struck our genitals, the women's and the men's. There were only a few minutes in the room, maybe 10 minutes. Was so frightening. The Germans were the most enlightened and educated people in all of Europe at that time. And yet, I saw with my own eyes Germans tossing babies in the air and shooting them. I couldn't believe it, but I saw it. It did happen. And they were laughing as they were doing this. You know, a lot of people don't know and they feel that we weren't really very passive. But if you want to look at history, and I'm sure you know enough, that countries like France or Belgium or Holland, they went, in a few days, the Germans came and took over. The Warsaw Ghetto was holding out for four weeks, even Poland didn't hold out for four weeks. We were holding out for four weeks. The Germans were really afraid to come into the Warsaw Ghetto. When they, they, they came in with tanks, and they decided to liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto. And this was 1943 Passover. And uh, by that time, there were maybe 20,000 people left. Uh, we didn't have much ammunition, so we threw uh, the Molotov, Molotov cocktails on the tanks. And a lot of Germans got killed. You see, my mother was with me and my brother. One day, when the Germans came in, this was at the very end of the Warsaw Ghetto. I want you to know my mother wasn't even 40 years old. Neither was my father. But my mother was... Uh, the Germans were coming, and we had to pull ourselves up on the door, but I told you, in the building. And uh, she couldn't make it, so she went into the bunker below with the mm -hmm. resistance. Uh, it wasn't exact. There were several bunkers. We didn't make big bunkers because we didn't want it. If the Germans will come in, we should have not all the people should be caught. So we, we, we had like five different bunkers downstairs, and we were hiding upstairs by 50, 60 people upstairs. My mother couldn't make the door because the Germans were coming very rapidly and uh, she was hiding downstairs and uh, after they left the Germans I went to look for her and she was gone everything was burning you couldn't stay there they, they smoked us out people had to get out from the houses you couldn't hide and then not only on top of this after the houses were burning they came in and they demolished them so even if you were hiding the people got suffocated underneath they came with a fire truck 
and with a ladder, they took us all down. So it was my brother, myself. At that time, I was married, my husband, and um, his sisters. We were all hiding there, maybe 50 people. Some of them refused to go. So the Germans killed them right there. So we piled up the dead people, and we were digging at the cemetery. And uh, somebody brought a little girl to the grave, a Jewish girl. She was maybe four years old, a blonde little girl. The parents gave her away to Polish people to hide. And the Germans gave an order, anybody who's going to hide is going to be killed. So they brought a little girl. And the gendarme was standing there on top of a little hill and watching us work. So he went over to her and he gave her an apple. And he asked her, what's this in Polish? So she named it Yapka, which is in Polish, apple. He asked her name and he repeated it, he uh, broke in broken Polish. He went back to his post and he started to lecture us about the Jewish mother. He says, this is kind of mother. This is not a mother who leaves a child. And he said, I assure you that she's not going to go far. That mother who ran away and left this child, we're going to get her. And while the girl was eating the apple, he shot her, he aimed at her. And the bullet went through her hair. And it screamed, the child screamed. Then he shot her again and killed her. And the child fell dead to the ground and the apple rolled away. And we buried her with the rest of the others. By 1943, my parents realized it was just hopeless, that there was no point in trying to live in this fearful way. And so they decided to send my sister and me to a farm family out in the country, for which they paid great sums, and I had to hide the fact that I was Jewish. At that time, I was nine years old. I had my sister who was seven and a half, and then the son came back to the farm and announced to me that my parents had failed to pay for the last five months. They never told us that they had already been taken by the last transport out of Bratislava. And I took my suitcase and my sister looking for a place to stay. And I would go to places where I knew people who were Christians, and I knocked on the door, and they slammed the door right in my face. And not saying a word, not explaining, just as if I were just a beggar at the door, and they just closed the door in my face. And finally, I went to the home of these friends of my parents who were living on the forged passport, and they did the same thing. And then I knew that indeed I was the last Jew left. There was nothing for me to do for two days. We were scrounging, we had no money. We were scrounging around, trying to find food. And uh, finally I said to my sister, we can't live that way. We will die on the street, so we might as well just go to the police. And I went to the police, and I said my name, and I said my parents' name, and I said I'd like to join them. And we finally were put on the train, and I was told that I would be going to Auschwitz. I saw they taking away the men separate, the children separate, and the woman separate. So I had, had the baby, and I took the, the coats, what I had, the, the bundles, 
and I wrapped around the baby, and I put it on, on my left side, because I saw the Germans were saying left or right. And I went through with the baby. But the baby was short of breath, started to choke, to choke, and it started to cry. So the German called me back. He says, well, what do you have there in German? Now, I didn't know what to do because everything was so fast and everything happened so suddenly. I wasn't prepared for it. To look back, the experience was, I think I was numb or something happened to me, I don't know. But it wasn't, I wasn't there even. And um, he stretched out his arms. I should hand him over the bundle. And I hand him over the bundle. And this was the last time I had the bundle. And I was cold when they were piling us into the car. And they wanted everybody to move back so they could put more people in. Eventually, people kept going back, but there was no more room. I do recall them, they fired across to make more room. So they shoved another batch of people in. I remember a good percentage of people died. For three days, People defecated on the floor. Three days we didn't have any food or water. And again, I, then I remember that the thirst was the overwhelming thing. We just couldn't. Oh. That is, again, something that keeps recurring in my mind, this constant thirst. And I remember when they let us off the cattle cars in Buchenwald, there was a hose with water, and some people couldn't even make it to the water. I sneaked up uh, to the fence, and I found a hole there. It was a raw wood fence. And that was the day when I saw my train, my dep deportee train, and it just must have pulled into the station. Right in front of me stood one of the wagons, and one man immediately jumped off. My feeling was, my instinct, or what I made out, that he was asking for water. And immediately that as a soldier, uh, with the club of his rifle, uh, clapped him down, uh, and several times, I, to insensitivity, uh, uh, whether he died or uh, whether he was later put on the track. And then I ran away. I was so scared and I was so upset. I never saw anything like this in my life. I simply ran away. Yeah, I still hear the, um, the train, tum, 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 tum. Nobody said a word. We were just wondering where are they going to take us? One morning, I think it was morning or early afternoon, I don't know, we arrived and the, the train stopped there for an hour. Why, we don't know. And a friend of mine said, why don't you stand up? There was just a little window with bars and see. I said, I can't, I don't have enough energy to climb up. She says, I'm going to sit down and I used to stand on my shoulders and I did. And I look out, and I saw paradise. The sun was bright and vivid. There was cleanliness all over. It was a station somewhere in Germany. There were three or four people there, one woman with a child, nicely dressed up. A child was crying. People, people were people, not animals. And I thought, paradise must look like this. And I had such yearning, I still feel it in my bones. I had such yearning to live, to run, to just run away and never come back, to run to the end where there is no way back. And when I 
told the girls, I said, girls, you have no idea how beautiful the sun is. And I saw a baby was crying and a woman was kissing that baby. Is there such a thing as love? But my brother died in my arms. My younger brother was My husband's two sisters. There was not enough oxygen for all those people. And they kept us in those wagons for days. They wanted us to die in the wagons. You know, the kettle cars with very little windows. How old was your brother? Maybe 13. He wasn't even by my spirit. So you know, when my brother died in my arms, I said to myself, I'm going to live. I must be the only one survivor from my family. I'm going to live. I made up my mind that I'm going to defy you. I'm not going to give in. Because he wants me to die, I'm going to live. And before we arrived to Auschwitz, maybe a few miles, we, we were in Auschwitz already. We didn't know where we were. I never heard of Auschwitz. We just saw people running around like ma mad people, no hair and clothes with, with stripes. And I said to my father, you know, maybe we are going to survive. Look, there are people running around. Maybe they are workers. And my father said to me, look, my family, he said, uh, I think we have arrived. And there's one thing I, I want to tell you. Whoever survives, you've got to go and work right away. Sell your knowledge. Go to work. Keep your sanity. And keep the principles that you have been taught. The, 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 the train screeched. And, and we, all of a sudden, we, they came and they, they knocked at the doors. And we heard voices, dogs barking. And then there were people were jumping in, and dogs were jumping in with them. And they were screaming and yelling, arouse, 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 you know, and, and, and you were confused. You know, there was nothing. And one guy who walked in, it must have been a prisoner, says, says to me in Yiddish, has the gold? Has the brilliant? Do I have gold or do I have diamonds? I looked at the guy, is he crazy or something? And then I saw people been thrown out of there. And I saw older people, they had to go and, 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 and jump out of the, the, the train. The platform was low. And the train was high. And people were beaten. And then when he walked out of there, when finally he got out of the train, out of those, those boxcars, all of a sudden there was a stench hit you. You didn't know what that is. And nobody told you what is going to happen. Nobody told you where you are, what's going on. The only thing that you saw, we saw SS, and we saw prisoners in striped clothes. And I saw dogs who were sniffling. And I saw people being beaten up, and they tell you to stand in line, and then way in a distance you hear music, a band playing. My God, it was such a confusion. I mean, you didn't know what was going on. I saw this high SS, you know, from a distance, this high SS officer with a big German shepherd next to him. And the, the women had to step in front of him one by one. I saw a brief exchange of words. And I saw him pointing either to his right or to his left. And when I looked a little later, I saw all the older people, or mothers and children, or sick or handicapped people, were sent to his left. There also, these Polish people, both Jews and non-Jews, helped because they would say to these young women who carried their babies on their arms, 
give it to your mother, give it to your mother-in-law, don't be a fool, you can save your life. And many, th many, many women did that. They handed the babies to the older women and they went to the working site and they were saved. Their children perished. At the day we arrived in Auschwitz, uh, the SS people came in, the soldiers, and we were stark naked. We were waiting to have our heads shaved. And he recognized that opera singer, she was a Jewish woman. And he got very hysterical, a smirk on his face. And he made that woman, a middle-aged woman, get up, stark naked, and sing. What was your number? 50069. I still have it. I'm not ashamed of it. They should be ashamed of it. This man came, the stall SS man, and he pointed with a finger. He put my brothers together and my little kid brother there. And I told my little brother, I said to him, Sally, Gay to Tati and Mommy. Go with my. And like a little kid, he followed. He did. Little did I know that. That I send them to, to the crematorium. I am. I feel like I killed him. My brother, who lives now in New York, used to live in South America. Every time we see each other, he talks about it. And he says, no, I am responsible because I said that same thing to you. And it's been bothering me to... I've been thinking whether he has reached my mother and father, and when he did reach my mother and father, he probably told him, he says, I wonder what my mother and father were thinking, especially when, when, when they were all, when they all went into the, uh, to the, to the crematorium. I can't get it out of my head. It hurts me, it bothers me, and, and, and I, I don't know what to do. Auschwitz, if I would like to describe it, I would say that is, there has not been, there has not been, people did not invent an expression what Auschwitz was. It was hell on earth. And The silence of Auschwitz was hell. The nights were hell. And the days, somehow, he, we got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And at 4 o'clock summertime or 4.30 when the sun came up, it was not like the sun. I swear to you, it was not bright. It was always red to me. It was always black to me. It never said, nev ne never was life to me. It was destruction. And in the evening, when you dare to go out and you saw the flames of the crematorium, 
that was disastrous. The smell of the human flesh, which we didn't know it was. We were young kids, inexperienced of such horror. Who is? My father, my brother, and I were, throw, were taken in one direction. My mother was immediately put into another camp. I was particularly attached to my mother, so it was devastating, I would say. But uh, interestingly enough, as I said to you, there was an instinct, a sudden instinct of survival that, quite frankly, I didn't dwell on it. I can tell you honestly, I attribute my survival to this instinct because I saw children just falling by the wayside, people dying. As a matter of fact, I trained myself to be very brutal, very cold, and, and uh, oftentimes I, I, uh, I have uh, some... I guess I can't ask them to turn this off, can I? If you like. No, no, keep it running. It should be documented. I sometimes think I was made too inhuman because I didn't care about anybody else. There were all nationalities. A lot of people think that it was only the Jewish people alone, but there were political prisoners and uh, captured prisoners, uh, as such as I was. I was in the 11th Armored Division, 11th Armored Infantry, and they moved us to uh, Camp, uh, Camp Mauthausen. Uh, before I went to the quarry, I worked in, I suppose you'd call it like a carpenter shop, where they were working with wood. But I was anxious to get out of there because one of the men uh, made a mistake cutting a piece of wood and he tried to hide it, but he was seen. And the officer that was in charge there walked up and he picked up the, the piece of wood and he looked at it and he looked at this guy, you know, and then he grabbed him by the arm and went his arm into the bandsaw, threw the hand over in the corner. Of course, the man run over and he picked up his arm and he's trying to put his arm back on and he died because bled to death, you know. Nobody helped him. He just bled to death. I don't think there was ever uh, a week that went by when you didn't feel uh, this may be it. It was one of those situations that you always kept looking over your shoulder. You always had to think 10 steps ahead. You always had to plan what if, what if. Obviously, you don't always keep your head downtrodden. You try as, just to survive, you have to make light. So there would be times that I remember we would make some jokes. Uh, you try to lighten things up. Uh, for example, when we were in, in Buchenwald, I remember that my brother and I began to sing, to entertain people. There were some poets and writers amongst the Jews, and they began writing songs for us. And we'd sing them. And you say, how can you do this in this, in this inferno? How can you do this in all this... You had to find moments. When I was in the camp, I managed to find a roll of toilet paper. And I managed to also find barter, something I had for a pencil. And I started to write. And I was writing down everything that was happening to me. I was about my longings, my fears, conversations I overheard, things people had said. And at one point, this roll of toilet paper was found in one of the searchers by the soldiers. And I remember coming back from their pair, seeing a soldier 
sitting on the lower bunk from the one I was with the toilet paper and rolling it and reading it to someone else and laughing and finding it very amusing. When I s suddenly had rushed up to snatch it, he pulled it away and he said, no, this is too good for you. And he took it with him. And of course, I heard the conversation. I heard what they were describing. They, 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 one of the things that I remember him saying to the other was, she has a wonderful sense of humor. And I didn't remember writing anything funny in it. What I used to do was I used to take the sulfur from a bucket and I used to pour it into the missile. And we each one of us had a quota of doing it. And if you didn't do it, you were beaten. And that's when that laus, raus, machlaus, laus, machlaus is to be every second, every minute, ever driving you out of your mind. And to top it all off, that foreman, come lunchtime, he used to come in and have a sandwich, a thick sandwich in his hand with, with all kinds of, of, of wurst, kalbasse, kalbas, and you know, used to smell. It generates, you know, you know, it made you, f and you were hungry anyhow, and he used to eat it in front of you. And after he got through with it, he was, you know, he tried to, he threw it down on the floor so that we could all go and, and try and, and grab a crumb out of it. I remember the, the hunger, mm. that wrenching, twisting pain that lived with you on a daily basis. All you could ever think of is to get something to eat. You could never fill your belly. It used to be uppermost in your mind. You used to dream of a feast. Just one day you kept hoping you could go through the day without this twisting pain that you constantly felt. That is an indescribable feeling. One night I was so hungry I couldn't sleep. It was a very bad night. They were bringing in people for destruction from two particular parts of the country, from Benjamin and Sosnovyets. The and the screaming and the hollering was going on, and all three chimneys were lit up. It was like broad daylight. I couldn't sleep. My roommate, she saved a tiny, tiny slice of bread and a piece of margarine for breakfast. And that particular night, I stole that piece of bread from her. I never admitted. And she got up in the morning and she was swearing like a truck driver. And I just closed my ears not to listen to the swearing that she did. And still in all, together we went to work in the morning. And she didn't, the whole day she didn't forget that she lost her piece of bread. I never admitted that I took it. They put me in a block with 500 other women. Somebody told me my mother's there. My mother was taken a few days before, as I told you. So I went to see her, and you know, my mother was there. So it's like I lost her twice, really. But she was very, very lost. She was lost. She was very passive, she was very lost. And you know, they gave you uh, one portion of bread and one portion of, of soup for the day. And I, my mother became very skinny, and she was very thin, and she was very, you know, lost there. So I used to bring her my soup to her, and, my, and I just cut off a little piece of bread, and I said to her, you know, somebody gave it to me, eat it. And I used to give it to her and run out, because if she would say to me, eat a little bit, I would eat. I was very hungry, but 
I felt that she needs it more than, you know, I was younger. She needs it more than myself. So I used to give her the soup and run out because I didn't want to be tempted that I should eat with her. It was within a matter of months that my father became ill. Very high fever, that was one of the signs. You just touched someone and they were literally burning up. And he could not go to work. And generally, the word was, you've got to go to work, because if they find you in there. They had a sport. If someone became sick and they took him out, and he said, I'm all right, just I want to rest one day, they'd say, well, OK. See if you can run a straight line. And what they did, in his case, they took a bunch of people out. And they told them to run in a straight line, but they were firing bullets on either side of that line. So that if they couldn't hold the line, and that's what happened with my father. There was a period of time that I walked around, I would say that was the first year. I just kept asking, why? And I couldn't get the answer. I remember I walked by uh, a spot, and uh, a guard hit me very hard over the head. After I recovered, because uh, he did uh, put me into a sort of semi-conscious state for a few minutes, I turned around and said, he doesn't know me. I wasn't even thinking of the fact that I was a child. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. Why does he have such a hatred for me? Those things used to annoy at me. Uh, the brutality of uh, killing. There was a clean way of killing, and there was a brutal way of killing. I could not understand the brutality. And this one American, we kept telling him, be quiet, you know, be quiet. But he was very insolent, and uh, he was giving the Germans a, a, a lot of talk, a lot of language and whatnot. And he could speak a few words of German. And so I didn't speak any German at the time, so I didn't really understand what was going on. But the Germans were talking among themselves and pointing to him and laughing. And they took us to Mauthausen, and they staked him out. They stripped him and staked him out on the ground, just four arms, his arms outstretched and his feet outstretched. But they didn't put any pressure on him or anything to uh, hurt him. Come nighttime, of course, and he went to sleep. And all of a sudden, he hear screaming and yelling and whatnot. And we jumped up, and we go rushing out. And it's dark, and we're bumping into each other, and went over. And the, a lot of the Russians had been there for, like I say, a number of years, and had turned to cannibalism. We didn't realize it then. But they had so badly torn at his body that he died from the, the effects. He was bleeding to death, and uh, nothing much we could do. And this is why the Germans were laughing, because staking him out just left him available. There were like five or six girls who were working the pool bomb where they put actually the ammunition, you know, the, the, the what do you call the powder, into the grenade. So they were every day searched from head to toe naked. And um, then they were going into work and then they left work. But they were able to smuggle out some of the pulver. How? In the vagina, in the mouth. We were able to smuggle out some of the powder. The powder was in something? In a capsule, a very small capsule, which were put, inserted into the grenade. So they, they, and then we gave it to the men, and we blew up one crematorium in Auschwitz. So I want you to know that there was, in the camp, in the concentration camp, with Germans surrounded, with really the impossible, we did blow up, we did blow up one crematorium. When the Germans were looking to the 
ruins of the crematorium, they were able to find the shells, and they saw it was from our factory. And they took the five girls, or the six girls, who were working in this ammunition factory, and they hung them. I just never got it out of my mind. It was so painful. And the whole camp had to watch. And they were hanging there for three days. You know, when I talk about it, I just have such pain. When I was at the last end of my time in the camp, and I was too sick, and I was told not to go on sick call, and I asked why, and they said, you don't come back from sick call. And I was pretty sick. And so when the Germans made their inspection, after everybody had gone out to work and found me there, and they started beating on me, and I crawled out of the barracks, and I crawled underneath, and underneath the barracks was all muck and slime and, and human feces and whatever. And I got down there. They tried to chase me out from under there. That night, when I crawled out, uh, some of the fellows that were in my outfit that were still alive uh, brought me some soup. And uh, the next morning, they piled me with the dead bodies. And I stayed with the dead bodies until nighttime, and they'd bring me back in again at nighttime because they would bury from one end the oldest bodies first, and they, they couldn't catch up with the amount, so they were, you know, cremating. So they put me with the fresh bodies. Every morning, that was one of the first things we had to do, was to carry out the dead. Right across from us was a charnel house filled with corpses, not just the inside, but overflowing all over. There were corpses all over. I lived, walked beside that people, and after a while, it, it just got to be so that one noticed and one had to say to oneself, I'm not going to see who it is. I'm not going to recognize anyone in this person who is lying there. And uh, it got to the point where I realized that I had to close my eyes to a number of things. And otherwise, I would not have survived even at that time because I saw people around me going mad. I was not only having to live with uh, all these things, but with madness. I was very sick. I got diarrhea. That was already recuperating a little bit from the malaria. And I walked out with two pails of human waste, and I was going towards the, the dump. I walked out in between the barracks, was a mountain of people I, as high as myself. Of course, I wasn't those, uh, you know, the wooden shoes, the Hollander shoes. And whatever, the, the people died at night, they were just taken out of on the dump, you know, a big pile of people. And I said to myself, oh, God, must I walk by? But in the meanwhile, I couldn't hold back, and I just put down the two pails, and I sat down because I had a sick stomach. And the rats were standing and eating the people's faces, eating, you know, they were having a... In a way, I had to do my job. I was just looking what's happening to a human being that could have been my mother, that could have been my father, that could have been my sister or my brother. Sometimes at night, I lay and I can't believe what my eyes have seen. I really cannot believe it. You know, I was in, in Auschwitz. 
whenever I got up in the morning, the lines were unbelievable. Whenever I used to get up in the morning, I said, my God, how can God allow this? The kids were standing in line, waiting to be cremated. spread around that the Russian troops are coming close from the east. So our hopes were on the rise again because we thought the Germans would just disappear or run away and leave us there to be liberated by the Russians. But that would have been too good a fate for us, too good a solution for us. Instead, on January 20th, they lined us up again, threw each of us a quarter of a bread inside the camp. Out, we were outside the camp, line up, and that's when the death march started. The, the march started. It, we didn't know then. Later it became known as the death march in the truest sense of the word. All the people, everybody who could walk, they just took, and I said, no, I'm not going, I don't care. And what we, they, what we were made believe that the whole camp is mined, that once the Germans will leave, they will blow up Auschwitz. I didn't care. I told you, after I saw those girls hang, something happened to me. I really was, this was already, I was so close to those girls, I just, it was just very, very, very terrible. So this whole bedraggled group was marching and people were dying left and right. And it was just, uh, it was absolutely, and there was nothing you could do. I mean, if you tried to help somebody, you know, you would stay there. It was not, I mean, it was totally hopeless, you know. As we started to march into the woods, it must have been late in the night when they made us stop. And we lay down on ice, because I remember in the morning, we woke up in the water. Our bodies melted the ice. The shoes we had gotten had wooden soles, and from walking so much, the soles wore off completely. Also, when the snow fell, the snow would stick to the soles, so you couldn't walk with them either. Anyway, they just dissipated. The shoes dissipated, and at that point, we would just rip a piece of cloth off our whatever we had, cold dress, and wrap it around our feet. And we couldn't bend our knees or the ankles, just walk like robots, just drag step by step. But we knew the minute we fall down, that was the end. My sister kept on saying she cannot do it anymore. And I said, you have to. And it came to one point that I had to take her on my back and practically carry her and uh, those who couldn't walk, the German would say once or twice, gay, the worst game, gay weiter. But some of them, they just resigned themselves. And we would march on, about 1,000 or 500 of us. And then about five minutes later, we would hear a sound of a gun. It started to rain. And it was like a uh, cloudburst, thunder, lightning. Uh, it was pouring. And they just kept shooting all night. They decimated us that night. This was one of the most unbelievable experiences any man can even visualize. When the nature came back to life, it's say a march or so, and things started to sprout, they would run into the field and pick a p blade of grass or, or, or a bud from the tree to eat, to eat, to eat, just to eat. We left five or 10,000 and uh, by the time the trip was over, there were only a few hundred of us left.
I was in my, uh, I guess, mid-twenties or late-twenties, 26, 27 or thereabouts at that time. My rank at that time was first lieutenant. I was an infantry officer in General Patton's Third Army. We were waiting. By we, I'm referring to my specific unit. We were told to stop and wait for the advance of the Soviet Army that was coming from the east, from Vienna, that they had recently captured and approaching us. Unfortunately, nobody counted that the Russian forces would be held up in Vienna. So the whole thing got delayed. And in the meantime, while the squeeze was going on, there was no food in the camp. And there were, I mean, it was sort of a, a concentration camp at its worst. There was in the, the camp was overcrowded. There were cases of cannibalism in the camp at that time. Uh, there was a little bit of grass or some stuff like that growing outside. It was all eaten up. There was nothing there. I'll never forget that there was a huge pile of corpses, huge pile of corpses, which were moving. They were still alive and, and breathing, but they were just piled up there. And this pile was actually moving, this whole pile. And you know, the moment somebody sort of fainted or passed out, you know, you just simply used to drag them and put them on there. Two or three tanks then stumbled upon Mauthausen concentration camp. Again, there was no prior knowledge, as far as we knew, to the existence of this major concentration camp. The, 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 the effect, I think, was pure chance that our American tanks found these. I jumped out of the jeep to head in towards the main gate. And uh, even though it was a beautiful day, very, very beautiful day, as I mentioned, I felt a brief chill. I don't know what caused the chill, perhaps a premonition of what we were about to see within the camp. But I jumped out of the jeep and then proceeded into the camp, looking around at this horrifying picture of stone, barbed wire, machine guns that encircled the whole camp. We heard lots of commotion all over. It was tremendous pressure all over. The, the uh, gates were closed. And I want to emphasize that South Sweden did not have only Jewish prisoners. We have been with uh, lots of Danish and Dutch prisoners and gypsies. And um, the gates were closed. And everybody was standing in the yard like one man. And about 11 o'clock, we heard a tank stopping at the gate, and two shots fired, and the gates opened. And as we ran, there was a white and a black American standing side by side in the tank. That's the first time I saw a black man. I loved him for it all my life. And he stood there erect, maybe because he understood. And the boss was running. And he shot him. I still see him lying there with his beautiful shiny boots that I was shining an hour before. And I had no pity on him. And we were liberated, and he said, everybody goes. And everybody went crazy, crazy. It was April the 11th, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I remember this clear as a bell. Uh, I remember the Americans coming in. I remember we almost killed one of them because we kept throwing him up in the air. And. Uh, he just couldn't take it. His body couldn't take it. But the, the first, there was that, is this really an American soldier? Don't forget, we heard the front coming up. You hear the, the bombardment. And you hear the heavy cannon fire in the distance. 
So we knew they were coming. And when you see the skeleton crew, you begin to realize something is happening. You walk around, you just say to yourself, is this really happening? It's, a, it's a feeling that is elation, but at the same time you say, don't get carried away because it might be a letdown. So you don't know whether you want to jump or whether you want to be happy or not. When they finally came in, and you saw the jeeps roll in, you saw the different uniforms, you realized it's over. The uh, thing that impressed, I think, all of us immediately was the uh, horrible physical condition of most of the inmates whom we saw. Some of them actually looked almost like living skeletons. I took a look at some, and, and uh, I would estimate their average weight might have been probably 85, 90 pounds or so. Many inmates, including some whom I met later, were in very bad situations physically from diseases. There was uh, diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid, pneumonia, diphtheria. You have it, any, almost any disease mentionable. One of the saddest thing in my life has been that I had no recollection of the liberation because I was totally ill with the typhus. Had I had to wait another two days for the English, I would not have survived. So they bring up these K rations, and they distributed that throughout the camp. Now, this produced a tremendous death rate instantly. People were eating that stuff and got uh, diarrhea and there was nothing in the world to stop it. You know, I mean, it was, it was like poison. And I remember there were doctors in camp, prisoners, kept going, going around saying, don't eat this, your bodies can't take it. Uh, I don't remember whether I paid much heed, but I know I overdid it. Thank God I didn't die. But, oh, I was sick. I was deathly sick. We talked with some of the civilians down in the camp, and uh, they, of course, denied any knowledge whatsoever of the camp. What they, in effect, were saying, uh, that up at the top of the hill, where the camp was, that this, to them, was just a training area for the German troops. In other words, they were trying to impress us w with the fact that that this was to them only a training camp for German troops. They admitted no knowledge whatsoever of the concentration camp, and uh, they, they just basically lied to us, perhaps with few exceptions all the way through, because when one analyzes the records of what had actually gone on at that place, the people could not help but know that the camp was there. And there was this American soldier who spoke Polish, and he asked us who we were. And we explained it to him he interpreted to the American boys, and one of them took off a submachine gun, he handed it to me, motioning to kill the German prisoners. I became very frightened, and I gave it back to him. I just walked away from him. I couldn't believe it that the Americans were real. I couldn't believe it that the Germans were actually defeated. It took a long time to understand that there was a stronger power than Germany. To us, they were the all-powerful, and they brain brainwashed us, brainwashed us to such an extent that we had no belief in ourselves, we had no understanding for right and wrong. And I recall the same afternoon, I sat down on a big stone, and I said to myself, what's now? What's going to happen to us now? We are all free. I be really free. Where's the family? I'm a young person who had a sheltered, innocent life. And what am I going to do now? Who's going to take care of me? After the war, we went back. We didn't even want to make lay claim to anything. We just wanted to look for our families. We were in Krakow. In that two-week period we were there, there were two programs. I, I cannot find the words to describe 
the feeling the incredulousness it's impossible to elucidate here I'm coming back from what I call hell and I remember saying to myself you know when we get back to Poland they're gonna feel sorry for us they'll open the doors for us and we arrive in Krakow and we're waiting in one of those holding areas for the DPs and they're attacking with non guns knives it was terrible the Russians were protecting us I heard a group of Polish people talking amongst themselves saying something to the effect well whatever Hitler did at least we're grateful to him for having solved the Jewish problem for us now this is after the war this is after what has happened to our people what I felt when the liberation came the time alone in the whole world I escaped from the transport I, I, I ran away two weeks before two and a half weeks before the liberation I ran away in Czechoslovakia I had no desire to live I had no place to go I had nobody to talk to I was just simply lost without words We arrived in June, it was June the 27th, I recall. And June the 29th, a group of children were going to a camp. And my uncle said, we're going to send you to a camp. Oh, God. <laughs> and we said, nothing doing. No, oh, this is a good camp. Nothing doing. Nothing doing. We wouldn't go. One of the things I remember as a child coming out I felt I had to tell the world what was happening. That was, that was the highest priority. So I remember the first few months in the yeshiva, I would speak freely. I would tell the kids everything. I would tell my rabbi what happened and so on. Then one day we went out on recess. And one of the kids got a hold of me. We were all in a circle, and he said, why don't you tell one of your bullshit stories? And from that day on, this was 1946, 47. I did not say a word. I would say till about uh, five, seven years ago. When I came to the United States, I was determined to tell everybody about my experiences. I was shameless, telling everybody in my family. And I'm afraid that they were not being very religious people. They felt that I had to move my own experience into the general experience of the Jewish people. And I found that it was a way in which they were telling me they couldn't bear to listen to it. The disgust, the, the German behavior towards us, the tortures days and nights, it's something that we have. It's, it's in our mind. We can't forget that. Six million people is just women and children. I can tell you everything in an interview. I couldn't even tell you describe one day in the ghetto. I don't want to live with that pain.
but uh, it's there. It's there, it forms its own entity in its surface whenever it wants to. I go on a train and I will cry. I will read something and I'll be right back there where I came from. And I can't erase it. I'm not asking for it. It comes by itself. It has formulated something in me. I am a scarred human being among human beings. I, I'd, I'd like to believe, as a person who has learned to think at a later life, and as a person who is a native German, that the Germans would not have been able to do all the, the, the total madness with the destruction of Jews and other nationalities if it had not been m sort of tied up in this, in this madness of the war. I, I'm a product of that culture. And I think uh, uh, many of the things that were brought out in its most negative form were, I'm, I, I was part of that. Uh, and I just really felt I had to get away from that in order to look at myself. I couldn't do that in Germany. I couldn't do that asking these questions and how, who am I? If this is Germany and these are Germans and I'm a German, am I like that? Am I that? I have given a great deal of thought how I should, I should conduct myself with, uh, with the Germans, how I should feel. Should I hate them? Should I despise them? Should I go out with a banner and say, do something against them? I, I don't know. I never found the answer in my own soul. And I have to go according to my own conscience. I cannot conduct myself, what my husband tells me, what my children, or what the world has said. And the only thing I can say is that up until now, I ignore them. I don't hate them. I can't hate. I feel I would waste a lot of time in my life. But sometimes I wish, in my darkest hours, that they would feel what we feel sometimes when you are uprooted and bring up children. I'm talking as a mother and a wife. And there is nobody to share your sorrow or your great happiness. I see it personally as the greatest treasure of my life that, you know, their uh, Jewish people were deported around me. I didn't do anything. I panicked. I, not even panic, not even fear. I just didn't know what to do. I don't know. I don't know if it was worth it. I don't know if it was worth it because, you know, when I was in concentration camp and even after I said to myself, you know, after the war, people will learn, they will know, they will, they will see, you know, we, we will learn. But did we really learn anything? I don't know.
Major funding for Witness Voices from the Holocaust was provided by the Charles H. Revson Foundation, the DeRote Foundation, and the Fortunoff Foundation.